the bride's response to the twofold test. Before I actually uh, get into this, I want to just mention something somebody said at the break. Again, it's the question on how do you pray this? And I just want to insist, because I want to be encouraging to you, that it is actually easier than you might think that it is. We're, we're prone to look for something profound and mysterious, but it's, it's really quite simple. In the very first session or two, I forgot which one, I gave a, a couple-page handout out on how to pray read the Song of Solomon. And basically, it's as simple as this. You take the statements that she says to the Lord, and you understand them intellectually a little bit, and you say those to the Lord. And then you take the statements that the Lord says to her, and you turn them around and say, thank you, Lord, these things are true of me. That's it. Now you know how to pray the Song of Solomon. But here's the deal, is that like in the natural A one-year-old says, you know, mama, dada, cookie, no, no, no. (laughs) And as you grow, your vocabulary increases. And so you start off like an infant saying a few, the flow isn't there of the heart, the language isn't developed, but you start simply with the very, what is your beloved more than another beloved? Lord, you are my beloved. You are more than all the other beloveds. It's that kind of thing. You simply take the very language, you add the element of you understand it, the interpretation of it, because you're studying it. And you simply speak the things to Jesus that she speaks to Jesus, and whatever Jesus speaks to her, you thank Him for for those realities and ask Him to give you a revelation of them. And you linger with it and be very, very repetitive. And over time, the language of your heart begins to develop, and your heart begins to unlock in a flow of language, but you start just like a, a, an infant does, just the little phrases. And literally, in that context, the Holy Spirit takes you by the hand, I mean, not literally by the hand, but the Holy Spirit literally aids you, and He unlocks your heart. Some folks might say, but how do I know He will unlock my heart? You will only learn to do it by doing it. And when you do it, you may be surprised a year or two down the road how simple it was to do it. But as long as you're looking for this mysterious way to learn and you never actually do it, then you don't experience the Holy Spirit engaging your heart. He will actually give you more language when you're saying the language of the Song of Solomon to the Lord. He will give you more, and it's true of all the Scriptures. And you just begin there. And it's the first uh, number of years that I began my prayer life. I wrote down my prayers for the first three or four years, and I had a growing prayer list because I didn't have language. So whenever I had said something that had that 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 was more than totally boring, I wrote it down. It wasn't ever like just out and out inspiring. I never had out and out inspiring for a number of years. For those early years, if it wasn't doubly dead, I wrote it down. You think I'm joking? I mean, my prayer life for for the first three or four years was really, really, really boring. And I prayed an hour a night, almost every day when I was 18, 19, 21, 22, right from my prayer list, gritting my teeth, and I didn't have the bridal paradigm and the understanding of the beauty of the Lord. I just raw prayer list. I mean, didn't feel anything. I just said, oh, this is a bad way to live, but it's the only way I know. And I would just say it. I'm absolutely serious. I'm not exaggerating in some kind of false humility. It was horrible. And I, wrote, I write about that in the Passion for Jesus book. And all of a sudden, those boring sentences that were not as boring as all the other things, you know, that's how they got on my prayer list, they begin to have just a teeny bit of life in it after a year, two, or three. And I don't think it's going to take all of you two or three years. I think the reason it took me so long is because the Lord wanted it to be my life message. He wanted me to have the struggle on the front end and a, and a greater measure of it so I would have understanding for others. And if it's really hard and you persevere two, three, four years on it and you do it diligently and it's not breaking through, probably you have a ministry to teach others how to break through. I'm not kidding. I'm serious. Most people seem to ignite quicker. Now, I've been doing this for 25 years hard. And so people will maybe look at my prayer life now and say, well, it seems to be fluid. Well, 25 years later on a near daily basis, of course, but uh, you don't know about those first four or five years. I mean, it it was torturous to my heart sometimes. I mean it. I I had tears. I had desperation. I said, Lord, I said this to the Lord very strong. I go, your Bible is boring. Everything is boring in your kingdom to me. 
except for meetings. I love to go to meetings. That's the only thing I liked was meetings. I didn't like witnessing. I didn't like fasting. I didn't like Bible study, and I hated prayer. Well, I really hated fasting, but I hated prayer too. But I liked going to meetings. That's the only thing I liked. And after a while, all of those other things begin to get inflamed over time. And the Lord was saying to me in it, he says, if I would have given you instant anointing on all of those, you'd have been reckless in your pride with no compassion or tenderness towards anybody else struggling. And if you struggle three, four, five years with a a certain perseverance, I, I uh, I would be very, very open to the idea that you probably have a ministry to establish people in this. That's why it's unusually hard for you. So there you have it. Okay, Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 9 to 6, 5. What is your beloved more than another beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than another beloved that you so charge us? These are the daughters of Jerusalem speaking it. They say it two times. She answers, my beloved is white, ruddy, chief among 10,000. His head is like finest gold. His locks are wavy. His eyes... Verse 13, his cheeks. Verse 14, his hands. 15, his legs. 16, his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Then they ask, where's your beloved gone, O fairest or most beautiful among women? Where's your beloved gone? Where's your beloved turned aside that we may seek him with you? My beloved has gone to his garden to the beds of spices, to feed his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tirzah, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they, your eyes, have overcome me. The overview of Song of Solomon, chapter 5, 9 to 6, 5. The twofold test results in a heart response of lovesickness, as seen in, in uh, chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. Her uh, overflowing heart of worship in chapter 5, verse 10 to 16, is the, is the expression of her lovesickness from verse 8. Divine testing reveals the deepest motives and desires. I will add this. Divine testing strengthens and purifies and establishes spiritual reality in us as well. Such tests may occur several times in our life. There are seasons of testing where the north wind overtakes the south wind. There are seasons when the south wind overtakes the north wind. But there are several seasons in the course of maybe 30, 40, 50 years that are, intense, that are intensified in terms of disappointment in spiritual and in natural circumstances, or one or the other. In her case, both of them were, uh, were uh, disappointing to a very intense degree at the same time. I mean, it's one thing when your heart is barren, but your life is prospering. It's another thing when your life is broken in every way, but your heart is alive. It's really difficult if your heart's locked and your life is broken. I mean, that's really, that's where she was. Disappointment in the natural and in the spiritual. Very, very difficult. The questions are, why do you love him so much? No, no, I, I forgot a sentence. The daughters ask the bride two questions in this, sec- in this section here. The questions are, why do you love him so much? And the next question is, how do we know him like you know him? That's the essence of the two questions. Her first answer focuses on the beauty of the Lord. Her second answer fo- teaches the daughters how they can grow in intimacy like she did. Okay, in the midst of the severe testing, again, natural and spiritual circumstances at severe disappointment. <laughs> I mean, that, when they're both going real bad, that is really difficulty. In the midst of severe testing, the bride gives one of the most extravagant human love responses in the Scripture, verse 10 to 16. I don't know of another place of Scripture where a more magnificent portrayal of the beauty of Jesus is declared than uh, chapter 5, verse 10 to 16. I believe in terms of my own experience, it surpasses any description, even in the book of Revelation, of the majesty of Jesus and his beauty. Then Jesus breaks his silence and he gives one of the most extravagant divine responses in all of Scripture to her in chapter 6. 
Chapter 5 is one of the most extravagant human responses to God. And chapter 6, I believe, surpasses even chapter 4. It's the most just absolutely heart wounding in love, if you want to say it that way, heart ravishing statements that God gives. And we're going to look at both of those passages next week in detail. We're going to look at her, we're going to look at chapter 5 again next week and we're going to develop each one of the 10 features that we're just going to look at just ever so briefly tonight. We'll develop them line, phrase by phrase next week. And then we're going to look at her, his response to her. Next week we'll, well I know I told you this week would be one of the, you know, but next week is the real one. I just give a little overview there of, of the 10 attributes. She responds in perfect obedience with a heart cry. Jesus is dazzling. He's chief among 10,000 because the question is, where did he go and why is he doing this to you? She says, he's dazzling. I'm lovesick. I am nowhere even being tempted to be offended with him. Okay, the daughters ask the bride the first question. They ask it two times. What is your beloved more than another beloved, most beautiful among women? What is your beloved more than another that you charge us? Now we know the charge is, is, was the end of last session, chapter 5, verse 8. She says, I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, help me find him and tell him I'm lovesick. And they're responding. They go, what is he that, that you are so lovesick over him? Look at the way he's treating you. What, what do you know that we don't know about him? Because the daughters are other believers, more uh, they're carnal believers living in a superficial life in, uh, in the spirit. Again, it's not an actual description of a group of people in the body of Christ. We figure out they're the daughters. It's depicting, it's a caricature of superficial, soulish, fleshly life in the body of Christ. The daughters say, what is your beloved? The spiritually dull, passive daughters of Jerusalem ask the mature bride another question. They asked a question in chapter 1-7. They've asked several questions throughout the psalm. They've asked, that's what I said, they've asked her several questions. There you go, <laughs> throughout the psalm. The issue that provoked the daughters was the bride's deep lovesickness for Jesus. This provoked them even more than the bride's wisdom or the bride's anointing and giftedness. The bride was growing in wisdom. The bride was growing in giftedness, Undoubtedly. Her chapter 4, her gardens were like streams and wells and rivers. I mean, her giftedness was beginning to emerge uh, quite profoundly. But what impacted her, the, the others, was her lovesickness, not her profound ability to solve life's problems, which that anointing of wisdom is profound, not even just the anointing to uh, bring healing or the power of God. It was, the, it was the power of her lovesickness riveted them. They said, what is the deal? What do you know that we don't know? And I want to say this. I believe that Holy Spirit lovesickness for Jesus will be the most powerful and the most mysterious and uh, a reality in all the world at the end of the age. It will have the strongest drawing power to both believers and unbelievers. The first commandment to first place in itself has a power to draw millions into abandonment to the Lord Jesus. Even more powerful than miracles and even the power of apostolic wisdom to solve the problems of life through the Word of God. The heart, the resolute heart. You may not ever have the same anointing of miracles another person has. You may not have this, the ability to have the spirit of wisdom on you to solve the problems in the body of Christ or in the lives of people. But you can have as much lovesickness as you want. And that is the most powerful when it's all said and done. It's called the first commandment restored to first place. They saw the lovesick heart that adorned her in God's beauty. This lovesickness adorned her. It made her beautiful in the beauty of God. We love a lovesick person for Jesus. They're the heroes throughout church history. Revelation 21, 2, the Father uh, declares he will adorn the city of the bride and he will adorn her for her husband. I believe the, do the Father adorns us for Jesus and the way he does it is by putting his own love, John 17, 26, into our hearts. We are adorned and made beautiful by the Father putting his own supernatural love into our spirits for Jesus. They saw Jesus as the one with the power to produce an insatiable lovesickness in the bride. They said, the Jesus we worship doesn't have that power on us. He must have something that you see that grabs you. 
Some of your hearts are pounding right now because that is your, your, that, that's the place God has called you to. He's going to adorn you with love sickness and cause you to woo ones and twos and some, some of you will, will woo hundreds and some thousands and some millions. Adorned with love sickness, wooing believers and unbelievers into the first commandment by the beauty of the Lord. That is really the, the, uh, the uh, uh, ministry assignment the Lord has given some of you in this room right now. It's a great one. It's the, it's the ministry assignment of Mary of Bethany. Adorned with love sickness, filling the house with fragrance, a memorial all through history that people look at and say, I want to love God like Mary. No one ever said, I want to heal the sick like Mary did, or I want to solve the problems in the body of Christ or the people's lives through the Word, through the word of God with wisdom. They just said, when you see Mary, you want to be abandoned, right? The essence of this question, how can you be so devoted to him when he seemingly treated you so harshly? They're, that's what they're saying. Tell us your secret. We follow him, but not the way you followed him. He withheld his presence from you. He allowed you to be kicked out of the church. Your, ministry's dry, your ministry anointing dried up. Your opportunities in the church, you were scandalized. Bad reports, persecuted, mistreated by the church, not by the world. Again, it speaks of difficulty in circumstances, whether it's ministry or not. It's just difficulty and disappointment is what the twofold test talks about. Why are you so tenaciously loyal? What do you know about Jesus that we don't know that has led you to joyfully give everything up and not be angry, but be filled with the romance of the gospel at the same time? That's the question. They can't understand this kind of supernatural devotion. It's devotion from another world. It's the Father's love for His Son put into the human spirit. They can't grasp it. They said, what is your beloved? What is your beloved? They didn't say, who is he? They know he's the Messiah. They know he's the Savior. They know he's the one that's in the Scripture. They know his name. But they don't understand his majestic splendor. That's unknown to them. Up to, they don't see the beauty of the Lord and the Jesus they're so familiar with in their Bible studies. The daughters had other beloveds before the Lord. They said, what is your beloved more than all of the other beloveds? The church in the Western world is absolutely uh, over, over full with other beloveds. The first commandment right now is definitely in the, in the church. It's in the top ten. The first commandment might even be in the top five in the church, but it's not anywhere close to number one. There's many, many other beloveds. There's the more overt, crass ones of money, pleasure, prominence. And there's the more subtle ones as spiritual authority. We, some of us love the anointing even more than we love the Lord. We love ministry even more than we love the Lord. There's, there's spiritual other beloveds as well as natural other beloveds. And they want to know, what is you, why is he so fascinating more than all the other ones that we love? And in the church today, ministry, anointing, power, money, prominence, honor, ease, many of those things are more fascinating to God's servants than the Lord himself is right now, but it's going to turn around. People often love the permissible, the permissible privileges of the world that the Lord, some privileges that Paul the Apostle said, they are lawful, but they're not edifying. He says, they are permitted by God, but they won't unlock your heart. They will only dull your heart. There are things that the Lord permits, that the Lord does not count sinful, but they don't unlock our hearts and expand us and create yearning. They don't cause myrrh to touch our spirits, the willingness to go into intimacy with the Lord, even in the place of of the fellowship of suffering. The deep respect the daughters have for the bride, they call her most beautiful among women. They have profound respect for her, far much more than, the, uh, than the, the watchman did. The watchman wounded her and took her veil away. But these younger ones says, well, we don't believe all the reports. We know there's something in you. you we like you. We don't know wh- how you do it, but we like who you are. I tell you, when the Lord begins to release that bridal anointing in a greater way upon his servants, that first commandment, Bridal anointing of the beauty of Jesus, there will be multitudes of people, young believers, and they may be old in the natural, but young in the spirit, coming saying, teach us the way. We don't care what the false reports are against you. 
There will always be, I mean, for a while, God will make use of the soul watchman in the body of Christ to cause scandal everywhere. I believe that when the first commandment begins to really press in, there will be tremendous disruption in the body of Christ over the first commandment's uh, 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 increase to first place. It's going to cause some disruption. You think, well, that ought to, everybody ought to love loving Jesus. Well, now folks will call it legalism. They'll call it religion. They'll call it false doctrine. They'll call it all number of manner of things because the conviction will begin to press into the core of their own life. And they'll say, no, I'm not going there. I'm not going to arise and follow the Jesus of Gethsemane. I'm going to figure out a theological way to dismiss it. And they'll almost always call it legalism and the spirit of religion. It will cause its problem in its day. And the watchman will be more than willing to strike and to wound and to go after uh, this kind of, of a call. But many of you are called. God is calling you to stand and to say yes to the fellowship of suffering as he makes you a vehicle, a vessel, proclaiming the first commandment to first place in the beauty of the Lord. It seems so positive. But here's the problem with it in the natural. The message is positive. It's exciting. It's fascinating. But it's invasive. It demands a wholehearted response. And that is where its offense is. It's so in- invasive. It moves right in and demands a bridal response. Not a servant response at a distance. Not when, you, when you know, 8 to 5 and at 5 o'clock you time clock yourself out. No, no. The bride is passionate all the time to a passionate bridegroom. It's an invasive message. Seems just positive and fail-proof. No, it's very invasive. It moves right into the issue of thoughts and words. It moves into the issue of money and time. It touches the sex life of God's people. It touches their thought life. It touches the way they spend time. It touches what they do with food and entertainment. It moves right into the core. And I tell you, it is invasive, but it is exhilarating and powerful. Notice that the controversy created by the watchman does not cause the daughters to reject the bride. Ultimately, the false accusations won't impact, impact the sincere ones. The false accusations will only the... I mean, some of the sincere will be swept away for a while, but at the end, they all fall away, and the sincere make their way through. Maybe a little while, but we need those seasons in the Lord. The humility of the mature bride who sought their help. Why do you charge us to help you is what they're asking. Down in the middle of paragraph one, they've never seen such humility. She has such passion, such depth, but humility. Because so often when there's the beginning of depth, there's a proud spirit around it. There's a, uh, there's a, a parading of our depth, a, a uh, exhibition spirit that masquerades our our place in God for the, for the sense of attention. It's the measure before depth is really depth. And yet this bride has such a teachable spirit. She, her eyes are, uh, we never develop this in chapter 4, are behind a veil. What she sees, she guards in humility. The step before true spiritual depth, that pressing in has such a temptation of an exhibition spirit to masquerade our life in God for the honor and the attention of others. That's the step before depth. It looks like depth and it's necessary and probably we will all wrestle with it at that season. But at the end of the day, she has a deep humility. She goes to them for real and says, help me find my way. And they're going, help you find your way and it's for real. The bride's answer. Her first answer to what is your beloved is to proclaim the majestic splendor of Jesus. And again, we'll look at this next week. One of the most powerful descriptions of Jesus, one of the most outstanding expressions of worship in the Word of God. This is the one time in the song where she worships the King, the Bridegroom King. It's a magnificent, poetic unveiling of the splendor of Jesus. Knowledge of these ten attributes will bring us stability in the midst of the storms of life, in the dark night of the soul. I believe that these this beauty... You read Job chapter 26 to 31. Job had a revelation of the beauty of the Lord. Then he had another revelation of the beauty of the Lord, Job 38 to 42. Two sets of five chapters. The Lord unveils his beauty to him. It's the beauty of the Lord that stabilized Job. It's the beauty of Jesus that stabilizes the bride in Song of Solomon. And it's the beauty of the bridegroom king that will stabilize the end time church at the end of the age. 
Because a fascinated heart is not easily offended or easily discouraged. A lovesick heart does not easily quit. Many, many people will quit. Almost anybody will quit but a person in love. A person inflamed with love literally has no option to quit because the force of love propels them forward. A lovesick person doesn't think it through. A lovesick person is propelled by the power of love in their heart. And that's where the Lord's bringing His church. The Holy Spirit uses metaphors of the human body to convey ten attributes of God's personality. It's fantastic. She starts with a general statement. My beloved is white and ruddy, chief among 10,000. My beloved is white. I like how the the, uh, uh, New International Version translates it. My beloved is radiant. The word white, we'll look at next week, is a bright, is a brilliance. One version says he is dazzling. It's a it's an it's a intense, bright white. I like radiant. I like that word. I, like, I think the New American Standard says dazzling. She, here's the, the, the uh, daughters go. They go, why do you seek him? Why aren't you angry at him? You don't have the anointing of God's presence on your heart. Everything of circumstances are broken. And you're lovesick. She goes, oh, he's dazzling. He has fascinated me. They go, who are you? Where are you living? She goes, that my heart is living in another world. She goes, I love him. He's radiant. What a statement. This is not a compromising bride. Again, as some of the commentators suggest she is in chapter 5, verse 3. He is chief among 10,000. The metaphor denoting he is incomparably superior to everything. We're going to go through these just very fast because we'll look at them next week. I just want you to have them here. His head, his sovereign leadership... His locks or his hair, which speaks of dedication related to the Nazarite vow. His dedication is vigorous and youthful. It's not decaying. It's not losing its energy and its power. He's dedicated to God and to his church. His eyes, his knowledge, wisdom, discernment, etc. His cheeks. Cheeks throughout the song speak of the emotional makeup because... In the cheeks, the emotions of joy or anger or all the in-between emotions are, are portrayed. His diverse emotional makeup is like be- a bed of spices, like banks of scented herbs. His emotional makeup has all the diversity and fragrance of be- a bed of spices, banks of herbs. Oh, fantastic. That's the Lord Jesus. The power of His Word, His his lips are pure like lilies. It should say dripping with liquid myrrh. His divine activity. His hands are rods of gold. His, his divine nature with all the jewels is his activity. Again, we'll look at him next week. It's, it's a fantastic, fantastic description of the beauty of the Lord. Again, for the singers, you can't just sing this. Nobody would understand what you mean. You have to interpret it and then bring forth the, uh, the uh, meaning of it versus the actual language. The language is the language of love to an instructed lover. To uninstructed lovers that might hear it, they, they need instruction. To the heart of a mature bride that understands the biblical metaphors, it will woo them as it stands because they'll understand what it means. His body... Or the King James translated his belly. Or the other versions talk about it, his bowels of compassion. His tender compassions is what it's talking about. It's like the rare, beautiful, carved ivory inlaid with jewels, with sapphires. That's what his compassion is like. There's nothing like it in the earth. His legs, his walk, his administration. His countenance speaks of his impartation. David said, let the light of your countenance shine. Let the impartation of God, the intervention of God touch us. The communication of divine intimacy, his mouth. Remember, lips speak of words and mouth speaks of the kisses of the mouth, the intimacy. She says, intimacy with the Son of God is the sweetest, most powerful reality in my life. I don't care if everything is disappointing for a season of the north winds. It is most sweet. The, the, even the, the remembrance of nearness to him is enough to hold me in the season of the north winds. She says, I remember it. I don't feel it now, but the, remember, the uh, remembrance is so powerful. His mouth, intimacy, the kisses of God's word on my heart are so sweet. 
That even in the season of the north winds, I can stay steady because I know there's more of the Lord's intimacy to come. Then she says in the end, his comprehensive beauty, he is altogether beautiful. He's altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. Okay, we have some more. uh, uh, Again, we'll look at that next week. Oh, this is such a marvelous passage. I would, uh, my prayer is that some of you might spend literally one or two years, three years, studying the metaphors, these metaphors through the Scripture and through natural research. That's, I've been doing a bit of that, studying what these mean in the Bible themselves, how God describes these, and then how God has established these different uh, 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 parts of his creation in the, in the natural world, the beauty and the, and the uniqueness of each of these in the natural and bringing them together. Some of you may, the Lord may just call you for a year or two to give yourself to those, those seven verses, those ten attributes of the Lord. You'll serve the body of Christ well if he calls you to it. Write books on them and give them to us and we'll, we'll all work to get them across the earth. We want the body of Christ filled with this revelation. She completes her answer. She says, this is my beloved, this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. And they're standing back going, they're shocked. She goes, oh, I'm lovesick, where is he? And they said, why do you even want him anyway? And it's like she doesn't hear her the first time. Then they ask it twice in verse 9. Hello, why do you even want him anyway? She turns around, she says, he is dazzling. He is radiant, he is outstanding, his leadership, his heart His leadership through history, his compassion, his administration of all that he does. She goes, all these different things. He is altogether lovely. This is the one I love. This is my friend. This is who he is, daughters of Jerusalem. They're taking a couple steps back and they're going, my goodness, that was intense. I like the, the word, oh, Oh, daughters of Jerusalem. She's speaking of him with such passion and urgency and feeling. The end of of that paragraph, she uses Jesus himself to capture them. I like this. I'll just summarize paragraph one. She's not even rebuking them for not knowing. She doesn't say, you carnal, backslidden daughters of Jerusalem, isn't it obvious why I'm lovesick? She doesn't do any of that. She woos them. There's no rebuke. And see, I believe that the, the difficult struggle produces tenderness in God's servants when they bring others forth in passion. If there's no struggle, there's a know-it-all pharisaical spirit of, of religious accuracy that isn't, doesn't have the heat of true spiritual devotion involved in it. I like what John the Baptist said. I'm going to quote this a little bit out of context. I'm going to quote it out of context, but the, the principle is true. John the Baptist says, he must increase, I must decrease. John was talking about Jesus' ministry must increase, and John the Baptist's ministry must decrease because John was going to be martyred very soon, and he knew what was going on. But I'm going to use the, the spiritual principle. I'm going to use this in a, in a, as a spiritual principle. The way to get self to decrease is to get Jesus to increase. What I mean by that is some many many folks they try to decrease. They approach. They go before the Lord and they're trying to empty themselves all the time. And people say, "You empty yourself, God will fill you." I think it's opposite. I say, "You fill yourself with God, you'll empty yourself." I believe it is strategically and significant exactly opposite. I don't believe that we have the power to empty ourselves except we're filled with Him. A lot of folks approach the Lord and they're repenting. They got the long list of repentance. They repent, they repent, they wear out, they repent, and they get into all kinds of funny mindsets. I have a better approach. Let Him increase, and you will become bored with the things you were laboring to repent over. They will begin to bore you. Him increasing causes an inevitable decreasing of sinful tendencies and fear-driven tendencies of our life. A fascinated person simply doesn't sin as much, they don't quit as much, they don't divide as much, and they don't do all that other stuff as much that's negative. A lovesick person obeys better, works harder, is more unified, presses in, endures more. 
I'm going to use the uh, same uh, uh, illustration here in the, in the next verse. John the Apostle said, light shines in darkness, and the darkness doesn't comprehend it. The darkness can't overpower light. And what I have in the next couple of paragraphs here is if you want to get darkness out of a room, it would be absurd to send somebody in the dark room and take a bucket full of darkness, run out and empty it out the window and run back in. You don't. You turn light on and darkness is driven. Darkness cannot overpower light. The darkness of this room simply does not have the power to put the lights out. And Jesus said, there's a light that shines into the world. It shines even into the human heart. And, it, and darkness cannot comprehend it. Darkness cannot overthrow it if it touches in reality in a responsive heart. You fill yourself with the knowledge of Jesus and your repentance. I mean, there are times when the Lord will press you on an issue, but the long repentance list will go away. Some folks think that's a bit reckless. I just push them into the beauty of Jesus and push them with all their might and they come out repenting. Well, actually, lots of things just begin. They just begin simply to drop them. They get bored with them. They don't have the power over their heart they used to. A fascinated person doesn't sin very well. A person fascinated and lovesick with Jesus does not sin very good. I'll leave my, I'll end my case with that. It's true. <clears throat> Paul the Apostle said, the riches of kindness motivates to repent. A lot of people want to skip the riches of kindness, and they want to motivate pe- people to repent. It's really hard to get people to repent without the riches of kindness part first. Romans 2.4. That's not on the notes. So I have the ministry with the daughters. It was an orchestration of the Holy Spirit helping her to refocus on the splendor of Jesus. This reinforced her affection for him. The enemy was trying to make the bride forget the excellencies of Christ to get her to focus on her mistreatment so she's offended. The rehearsing of the beauty of Jesus to the daughters actually empowers the bride in a very strategic season of her life. The occasion to speak of Jesus' beauty brought pleasure and satisfaction in the midst of a great trial. A heart that enjoys Him, that is fascinated with Him, is significantly protected against the offense and added temptation. During times of personal dryness, we must imitate the wisdom of the bride. We recall the excellencies of Jesus to ourselves and or we recall them to others in need. Boy, when we're hurting, in, when we're hurting we don't want to minister and sometimes the Holy Spirit will orchestrate it. We're hurting in the most severe spiritual and natural disappointing circumstances. Our heart is like raw nerves and the Lord brings someone right in our path and He's doing it in mercy to have you, He's orchestrating the event so you speak of the beauty of the Lord out of the depth of your history in God and it awakens them and it protects and strengthens you. It's the wisdom of the Lord. And if the person, the Lord didn't bring the person before us, it's these ten attributes that strengthen and awaken us when we're in the time of the twofold testing. Jesus has been silent all through the testing. He hasn't said a word yet. Jesus hasn't said nothing since chapter 5, verse 2. Or chapter 6, verse 1, he's still quiet. He's still watching her. They now ask a second question. The first question, remember, was chapter 5, 9. What is he? She doesn't answer, so they ask it again. They, I mean, they're, 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 they're pressed by this. Why are you doing this? It doesn't make sense. You're wasting your life. There are so many other beloveds. You could have a great ministry. You could be rich and famous. You could make something of yourself. I tell you, you would stoop to be the president of a nation if God has called you to devote your life to the beauty of God. They can't, they can't make sense of it. You're wasting so many opportunities. What is he when there's so many other beloveds? Now they change their question. They don't say, what is he? They say, wow. Now they say, where is he? We want what you have. The first commandment restored to first place, I believe, is one of the most powerful realities of God, of God awakening the, the church and bringing in the harvest. It's simply people lost in lovesickness to the beauty of Jesus. Where is he gone? The same conversation from verse 5-8 five, five, is continuing. She says in 5-8, remember, help me find him. I'm lovesick. 5-9, where is he? 5-10, he's dazzling, he's outstanding. His hair, his locks, his legs, his arms, etc. My beloved, he's, he's altogether lovely. Now they said, whoa, where is he? We want to know what you know. The bride's testing becomes an opportunity for their maturity. 
she not only matured in deeper ways, but others who saw her matured because they wanted to be like her. And in this, in this paragraph here, I say this, many people are watching. And you don't know who is watching you. It may be one year, it may be five years, but many people, people are very, very interested in how the servants of the Lord bear pressures and disappointments. And when they see one of God's servants come through the fire, lovesick, it, it makes them, it gives them hope. There's something they don't know. And, they, and when it, this hope really touches them, they will cross any ocean, they will pay any price to touch the reality of what they see in another. Love sickness is the most powerful reality in the human experience. And when they see a person have it in the most intense form through the beauty of Jesus, they said, we saw you. It was, un- it was supernatural the way you held yourself. You weren't offended at all. You didn't draw back. You were so stable. What was your power? She goes, I was love sick, the most powerful force in the human experience. Especially in the Holy Spirit, they'll say, we'll cross any ocean to have what you have. I tell you, it's going to be a very powerful It's going to disrupt and change the balance of power in the body of Christ when God begins to raise up men and women all over the earth who are lovesick, but they're not in the powers of authority or position or ministry. The multitudes of the body are going to want to hear what they have to say. Oh, we want to seek Him with you. We want what you have. Beloved, this is 1998. My, I can't wait to see what some of you will be writing 10 years from today on these passages. It will go so far beyond this. Some of you are beginning right here, and you'll go so far beyond this. You won't have two pages that say the same thing. You'll have 30, and I'll smile at you and wink. Okay. The bride answers the second question. They're saying, where can we find him? And she answers, and I'm just going to be brief on this as well. And I really want you to read this. Her answer in one sentence is, Jesus is in the midst of his church. He's gone to his garden to the bed of spices to feed his flock in the gardens and to gather lilies. Every one of those phrases is so powerful. Jesus was never really absent. He was always in the garden the whole time. The garden speaks of several things. Number one, the garden, there's the garden plural and the garden singular, uh, A2. The garden singular is the universal church. The garden plural is all the local bodies of Christ or the local ministries across the earth. There's his garden and the gardens, plural. It's the corporate dimensions of the body of Christ, both universal and local. But there's another uh, interpretation of the garden. Chapter 5, verse 1, it's her heart. She says in chapter 4, 16, Come to my heart, which is now your garden, and eat and feast on me. And Jesus is saying The whole time he's saying, I've always been in your midst. I've always been in my garden. I've been in the midst of her life the whole time or in the midst of the body of Christ. And her heart was a bed of spices. Remember 416? She wanted the spice to flow forth. He says, your garden has been a bed of spices. And he could say the same thing about the church. Jesus is in the midst of this church. He's building his church. The weak, broken body of Christ worldwide, he sees as a, as a bed of spices. He sees such loveliness in the midst of his church. And though he will hide his manifest, discernible presence from a person for a season, he's always attending to, he's always feeding and gathering either individuals to himself or individuals together into the body of Christ and then to himself. He's feeding and he's gathering at every stage of redemptive history. Even though he sends the north wind, I have this in the notes, he's feeding her even on the north winds. She says, I understand now that the trial is over, that he was always in the church all along. He never left the church. Matter of fact, he was always attending to me. I am his garden, 416. And the spice I wanted to flow, it's a bed of spices. He was bringing forth my life. And matter of fact, he's been feeding me the whole time. See, the Lord will feed us on the north winds to bring spice and the intimacy and the fellowship, the deepest realms of intimacy that most never enter in. Again, many will enter into the intimacy of worship. Many will enter into the intimacy of anointing for ministry. But very few will say yes and arise to intimacy and the fellowship of suffering. But she sees now that the Lord was feeding her. He was always the whole time in the midst of his garden where the spices were. And I developed those ideas a bit in the next several pages. 
He's gathering. There's three things he's always doing here. He goes to his garden, he feeds them, and he gathers them. He goes to them, he feeds them, and he's gathering them at all times. And it says at the end of verse 5, he feeds his flock among the lilies. You know one way he's going to feed you? The lilies are the individual believers. Throughout the song, the lilies constantly are the individual. He is going to feed you by having you feed a devout person and then having that devout person feed you. Let me say that again. One of the ways that he will feed you is by making you feed them and Jesus will unlock your own heart while you're ministering to them in the deep things of God. He feeds among the lilies, amongst the devout. When two devout young people, old people, two devout people get together, that Jesus begins to feed one another. He feeds them among the lilies, amongst the devout. The enemy does not want the devout to cluster and to gather and to be empowered because they, then Jesus will begin to feed among the lilies in the bed of spices. Okay, I know that you're kind of looking at this saying, I'm not exactly 100% sure, but the notes will develop it more. I'm developing the garden, again, the, the corporate dimension of the garden. It's both universal church and it's the local church. The individual dimension of the garden is her individual life. All of those different aspects are the bed of spices to him, and he feeds his people through the north and the south winds. No matter what he's sending our way, he's feeding us in the lilies, in the midst of pure people, and he's feeding us on the pure, deep river of God. He's feeding our spirit on the deep things of God, on the lilies. Jesus breaks the silence. Now it's been since chapter 5, 2, and he says, Oh, my love, you are as beautiful as Tirza. He hasn't said a word to her. His presence, his discernible presence lifted her, lifted from her, and everybody struck her. The ones that liked her, the daughters, were a bit perplexed and thought she was investing her life in the wrong way. They said, we don't know why you're pressing in like this. The, the ones that liked her thought she was off, but they appreciated her. She is like totally alone. But she's lovesick and she's in love. Now the Lord says, I've been quiet on purpose. He suddenly breaks his quiet. He suddenly breaks the silence as, as he suddenly withheld his voice from her. And he says, I'll tell you what I think. Oh, my love, you are so beautiful to me. He goes, you stood true in the test. And you showed yourself forth as being totally for me. I really am. Your heart really is my garden. You meant it in 416, didn't you? You were in this thing for me 100%. Look at you. Nothing going for you. And you worshiped me with Holy Spirit love sickness. Look at you. He says, oh, you, you're as beautiful as tears and lovely as Jerusalem. You're awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me for you have overcome me. Jesus describes her beauty with these metaphors using the language of love. Oh, my love, he hasn't spoken since 5-2. He answers the bride as he suddenly breaks his silence that has continued through the entire time of testing. The Lord continues in silence because so many things are being established in us in silence. He's creating humility. He's creating hunger. He's, compla- he's, he's uh, creating compassion in us through silence. He knows it hurts us. But if we're really in it for Him, the pay is the same. Whether we feel things or whether the circumstances bless us or don't, if we're in it for Him, the pay is the same at the end of the day. And that's what's happened. Jesus is is not just a means to an end. He's always a means to an end. But he is also now the end of her life as well. He is is the means. He is the source of her life and joy. But he is also the goal and the object of her life now. He is the means and the end. Not just one versus the other. He reassures her of his great love. This is his first utterance to her. You said yes to me in the most severe testing of your life. He's not rebuking her for the alleged disobedience of 5.3. The reason I say that, because so many commentators will, will say she was disobedient. It's unthinkable to me. She was disobedient in 5.3. He says, you are beautiful as Tirzah. Tirzah was to become the capital city of the northern kingdom after the civil war, which happened a generation after Solomon wrote the song. A generation later, Tirzah was to become the, the capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital of the southern kingdom. But this is actually before the civil war, before it actually is. So it's clearly the city. It means beautiful here. 
It's one of the most attractive cities. It had a beauty and a strength and a a political and military strategy to where it was the logical choice as the capital of the divided, divided kingdom. But this is, again, a generation before it happens, and Solomon, look, Solomon looks at Tears. That's a well-known city for its beauty and for its strength. It's, it's, uh, it's well-positioned and it's beautiful. Tears itself means beautiful. Then Jerusalem, well, that's the city God ordained as the national center of worship. It's the place of Solomon's temple. Solomon's right the song. His own temple is in Jerusalem. It's where the sacrifices that speak of the coming of the Messiah. It's where the Shekinah glory of God. It's where the spiritual beauty of God is concentrated in Jerusalem. He says, you are as awesome as an army with banners. An army, a banner speak of a, uh, an army with banners speak of a, of a victorious army. If an army came back victorious, it marched down the streets with banners in a great uh, military procession. A defeated army lost its banners at war. An army with banners means it's come back home and it's, 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 it's uh, participating in the great procession of celebration and of victory. Number t- uh, A, he looks at her and he says, you are like a victorious army that gained the victory over your heart. He goes, look, my presence, my presence lifted, but you loved me. The people struck you. You lost your ministry, but you loved me. He says, you have conquered the most powerful foe you will ever face. Sin in your own heart and unbelief and fear. Look at you. Through the word of God, you've conquered the greatest enemy. Far more powerful than the devil is the fear and sin in the human heart that says no to God. Because we can overthrow the devil through the name of Jesus, but our own voluntary decision, we have to say yes to under the, uh, the power of the Word of God. Time of testing, the Holy Spirit poured such loyal love into our heart. Now, now listen, beloved, we're talking about the God who created in Genesis 1, declaring she is awesome. Now I know that to some people this is like a pretty neat love song. Beloved, this is not just a neat love song. This is the very Word of God. This is the transcript of God's holy soul of love. And I know that on the front end of this, when the Lord first began to call me into Song of Solomon back in 1998, it was a really neat love song. I like the analogies. It had not connected. But just over the years, not that I'm by any means fully there. I'm still at the beginning of the beginning. Beloved, this is more than a neat love story where you can bring analogies and share the Bible study. This is the very transcript of God's soul. He looks at human beings and says, in your victory over your fear and your sin and unbelief, it is awesome to me that you have done this. Blessed are those who believe and do not see. It's that blessedness of pressing in, which you can only do in one time in your entire life of billions of years of your eternal life. You can only do it while on the earth. You can only have the blessedness of believing without seeing for a moment of time on the earth. Seventy years on the earth, and that blessedness is gone forever. A blessedness the apostles never had. They always saw. They saw Jesus face to face for three years. They never entered into that dimension that we enter into. The seraphim, the cherubim don't have that. Even the Son of God as a man never entered into the not seeing dimension. It was something that he reserved for his church on the earth. A certain blessedness that is according, it's it's, it's proportionate in the heart of God to the weakness of our blind hearts. He looks at us, he says, oh, I pay well. There is a blessedness, it will all be returned to you in eternity beyond anything you can imagine. He says to her, turn your eyes away from me, for you have overcome me. Her single-minded dove eyes are irresistibly beautiful. Her eyes are fixed on him during the 5-6 testing. Remember 5-6, his presence lifted, but her eyes are fixed. If the, I'm just adding this. The glance of chapter 4, verse 9. Remember, the gl- one glance of your eyes has ravished me. Well, the gaze, the steady gaze of worship, you are dazzling, you are radiant. It, over, well, it, over, it overcomes the very heart of God. We don't easily understand the heart of Jesus being ravished by our glances in 4.9. We certainly have never seen any such devotion from royalty anywhere. Royalty has so much power over their subjects. They are not easily captured by their subjects. But this divine royalty is captured by his subject. He's ravished by our glance. He is captured by a people that press, press in when they cannot see. 
It's totally contrary to nature that the royal one would be captured so entirely. He's totally overcome by the weak, broken people who love him in the midst of trials. We've never seen such royal devotion anywhere in creation. No monarch in the natural has such royal devotion to his creation like the eternal king, the bridegroom king. What overcomes him? The stars don't impress him. The oceans don't impress him. The greatest armies of history don't impress him. Demonic powers and principalities don't impress him. Nobody conquers the unconquerable one. Nobody overcomes the Son of God. Yet one thing subdues him. The loving gaze of a bride who obeys him when she cannot see or feel and she encounters disappointment and yet she maintains her position of steadfast love sickness. He is the ultimate warrior of all of history. Yet he is easily conquered by the devotion of his bride. Jesus could not stand, withstand her gaze any more than one man can stand against an entire prevailing army. He says, turn your eyes away. He doesn't mean that, like don't worship me. He's saying in the language of love, you have very conquered the very heart of God. Amen and amen. Let's stand. Beloved, we have no idea what he feels when we don't feel anything. We're on the earth. His presence lifts. Disappointment everywhere. The natural circumstances. In this case, it's ministry. It might be in, in, in domestic circumstances. Maybe in relationships. Our heart feels raw and injured and hurt. We don't feel anything, but the memory of his, his mouth is sweet. Just everybody close your eyes. Just open your heart now. The Lord says, all the armies of the earth, I can vanquish them with one word from my mouth. He does it in Revelation 19. One word, he destroys the armies of the earth. All the armies of darkness, he vanquishes them with one word, the principalities and powers. But a people, in just that raw feeling of nothingness, and yet they stay true. God says, oh, you conquer my heart. He goes, the movements of your heart in chapter 4, 9 ravish me. But the steady gaze of love sickness when you feel nothing, I feel it so much when you don't feel it. Oh, beloved. Let's come before him. And I want you to bring the areas of disappointment and I want you to bring them and put them in your hands before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm lovesick. You are dazzling. You are outstanding. I'm yours. I don't care what happens. Let the north winds blow and let the fragrance flow and let my garden become a bed of spices. This concludes this tape presentation from Friends of the Bridegroom. For more information on resources available from Mike Bickle, as well as news about upcoming conferences and live broadcasts, visit our website at www.fotb.com. Thank you.